Thanks for being here. Happy New Year. Um, and again, it's been a crazy 2020. We're hoping that as we move forward, there'll be lots of better stuff happening in our country and on the planet. Um, so uh, again, all of your microphones are already muted. So um, at the end of the presentation, when we do our Q&A, um, you can unmute yourself um, or I'll be uh, asking the questions to Maya as we go along. So um, I wanna introduce my co-chairs. Uh, so we have Nancy Levine, yay, and um, Christine Hoey. And a big shout out to Christine because she's just been really awesome and awesome. getting this together and, and so much else. So thank you, Christine. Um, and the three of us love working together. So um, just, uh, just a quick heads up, um, our garden committee, which normally was every month in a different person's garden, um, with a lot of social events and kind of garden tours is not happening, of course. So now we're meeting every other month. And um, let me tell you what our next, our every other month. So March 9th um, at 6.30, we're gonna have um, a special guest speaker, which is David Newsom. How many of you have heard David Newsom speak before? He um, has, has Wild Yards Project and he was a presenter at our winter workshop. He's very charismatic. Um, very interesting and fun. And the topic of his talk is going to be as above, so below, what our gardens say about who we are and where we are headed. So um, anyway, he's a great speaker and we're looking forward to having him. Also, uh, we have a spring garden, I'm sorry, plant sale coming up and the catalog is available now on CNPS SD on our website. Um, online orders will be opening on February 15th and keep in mind that last the last plant sale, it sold out within 24 hours. So put your orders in early and then um, they'll be available for pickup. You can just go to cnpssd.org, um, plant sale February 15th, and you'll get the information there. And um, before we bring on uh, Maya, again, we just want to let you know that there's a chat box that's at the bottom. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. And um, then at the end of the talk, um, I will reference whatever your questions are and send them over to Maya. And um, again, just stay muted um, throughout the, the um, workshop, throughout the talk. And thank you, Christine, just put up the uh, link for the plant sale. So without further ado, Christine is gonna jump in and we're going to um, introduce our wonderful speaker that we're thrilled to have. Yes. So, um... I'm going to introduce Maya Argaman and just a little bit about Maya. She is the new horticulture outreach coordinator mm -hmm. for CNPS and started this position right after COVID. Oh, yay. Um, hit California. So she's had a bit of a challenge with everything going on. Um, she graduated from UC Davis with a degree in environmental science and management, where she fell in love with native plants in both the natural and built environment. Before CMPS, she was a field technician at the Bureau of Land Management in New Mexico and the Forest Service in the Sierras, and mostly worked, recently worked as a landscape designer in the Bay Area. She likes to spend her time surfing, hiking on Ring Mountain and amongst the coastal redwoods and biking on Mount Tam. So Maya, we are so happy you're here with us and take it away. Great, thanks so much for the introduction and thank you so much to everyone for inviting me and having me speak at this. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and let's see, it takes a moment for it to... So our saying is restoring nature one garden at a time. And we really believe that we can make a huge impact um, in the built environment, as well as conserving uh, wild spaces in California. So today I'm gonna talk about um, converting your lawn to natives. And I'm gonna talk about um, going over what a native plant is and its benefits in California, and then the nitty gritty of converting your lawn into a native plant garden. Um, so a native plant is a plant that grows here naturally in California um, prior to the European exploration of, Northern, of North America. And they've naturally co-evolved with the organisms and fungi and, and just all the, just uh, the complete 
foundation of all ecosystems. So native plants really are the basis of all um, networks in our ecosystem. And they are naturally adapted to the California um, climate, which is characterized generally, I mean, with climate change, things are unpredictable, but um, warm summers and falls and then characteristically wet winters. Um, and so what is the difference between native plants and low water use plants? So a lot of times in nurseries, you see, you know, Mediterranean drought tolerant plants, um, which don't live up to the benefits of natives in a lot of ways. Um, even though they're advertised as drought tolerant or low water usage, they still require more maintenance and water intake and fertilizers compared to native counterparts. So it just naturally makes a lot more sense to plant natives in your garden. Um, and now I'm gonna go into talking about natives and the bigger picture of their impact on California's biodiversity. So as all of you know, California is an incredibly special and unique space. Um, and we have more native plants than any other um, state in our country. And we have, we're considered a biodiversity hotspot. Um, and a third of our plants are endemic, uh, which means that they're not found on any other place in the entire earth. So it's really important to highlight the, the conservation of rare plants and keep them where they're naturally occurring. Um, and what we do in California matters to the whole world. So much, much of our country and our state is privately owned. I think it's around 50% of California's state is privately owned at this point. So while there is value in conserving these wild and undeveloped parts of California, it's really important to focus our energy on using natives in the built environment and in developed spaces. Um, and California is really a guinea pig in a lot of ways with um, policy and climate change mitigation and we can really set an example for the rest of the country and the rest of the world with what we do here in California. So like I mentioned, what can we do? We can, cons we can convert our suburban and urban and, de and developed spaces into rich natural habitat through the use of native plants. And it doesn't have to be like everything at once, you know, just rip out all of your plants and start fresh. You can really start small and plant a few natives here and there, or if you're in a small space, you can have, you know, have a few pots with natives. Um, anything, anything makes a difference. It's just as like, it's just getting started and exploring and seeing what works in your space is really important. So if we replant half of the US area that's now considered lawn um, into natives, then we can create over 20 million acres of new habitat. And that's greater than all the major national parks combined. And that's approximately the size of New England. So it's a really incredible impact that we can make if even just half of this, the country's lawns get converted to natives. That's a mass amount of habitat that's created. Um, so this is a great graphic for kind of understanding the future criteria for decision-making when you are looking into landscaping your space. So it's not only about your decorative value and what's blooming year round or um, you know what looks nice all the time. It's really important to focus on the food web value and um, providing habitat for wildlife and pollinators and um, what, you know, just all these different impacts make the decision. So it's not just about decorative value. There's other things that we can balance and CNPS is here to help provide resources for that. And now I'm going to go into just the general benefits of native plants um, besides what I've mentioned already. So native gardens excel at efficiency. There was this wonderful 10-year study that the city of Manic city of Santa Monica conducted where they had two test plots, one with native plants and one with non-natives. And 
native, the native garden just outperformed incredibly. There's just 83% less water, 56% less green waste and 68% less maintenance compared to the non-native garden. So it just really makes a lot of sense to just implement native plants in your garden. Um, just if you wanna save money and time and energy and all the things, it just is the logical way to go. Um, so native plants naturally have defenses that protect them from pests and pathogens in California because they naturally occur in the space already. So that being said, it means you don't have to have harmful pesticides or herbicides or fertilizers to your plants, which reduces harmful runoff that ends up in our watersheds and streams and oceans. Um, native plants also support local pollinators. We have over 1,600 native bee species in our state of California. Um, so that's, and those are the ones that we know of as of now. Um, so there, I'm sure there's a lot of other bee species we have yet to discover. But um, that being said, a lot of these pollinators are, have co-evolved with native species. So it's, it's really critical to provide habitat and sources of nectar and pollen um, through these native plants. And they also support local wildlife. Um, as I mentioned, so much of the state is developed. So it's really important to, you know, when you can incorporate natives into your landscape to create um, wildlife corridors and bridges between developed and undeveloped spaces in California. Um, so now that you've all con been convinced to use natives in your space, um, I'm gonna go over how to get started and just um, the, the steps needed to be taken in order to design a native garden. So first thing that's really important is your site conditions and really understanding um, the space that you are trying to design. Um, and that will really ensure long-term sustainability and you know, avoiding costly mistakes moving forward. Um, so the first thing is to really understand the climate that you're in. Um, like I mentioned, California is characterized by Mediterranean climate, um, but there are so many microclimates um, in California and even where I am in San Francisco, just I'm in the fog, but if I drive 10 minutes east, it's sunny eight months out of the year. So really being, a being uh, mindful of the microclimate that you're in and choosing plants that are suitable for that climate is uh, really key for success. Um, another thing is sunshade exposure. So spending a day outside and really observing how the sun moves in your space is really critical. So, and if you have um, like permanent structures and other things, um, just being mindful of how the sun casts a, sh casts a shadow throughout the day and also how, you know, morning sun is very different than mid afternoon sun and being aware of where, you know, you have shady spots and sunny spots is really critical as well. Um, and soil. Soil is also a really critical aspect of planting a native garden. Um, CNPS recommends getting a soil test um, just to really fully understand what kind of soil you have. And, you know, you, especially in urban and suburban areas, like you might not have native soils. Um, so it's really important to understand the full scope of the soil that you're working with and be able to add amendments and um, accordingly. Um, and once you've kind of gotten a grasp on those site analysis, analysis um, you can dive into designing a plan. Um, and this is the fun part in my opinion. Um, so, the first thing to do is just have a rough sketch of your design and, you know, starting with the permanent structures that you have, um, your pathways, your trees, your house itself, driveways, um, et cetera. And then from there, you can move into a bubble plan. And this is a great graphic. Um, and with this bubble plan, you can also you know, think about what you want out of your space. Um, do you wanna have an area for your dog to run around or do you want an area for your kids to play in or is this gonna be a, you know, a place for you to be out at night and hang out at night in or 
um, more of a pollinator friendly garden? What is like the design and purpose that you're looking for? And another key aspect is hydrozoning, um, which is the idea of grouping plants together that have the same water needs. Um, and this is really critical when you're going into plant selection. Um, and generally with, with garden design, you wanna have your most high intensive um, watering plants within 30 to 50 feet of your house. Um, and the further out you go, the less maintenance and water you, you want. From that oasis zone, you want to have plants that really just need to be established, like just need to be watered for establishment and then afterwards can just rely on rainfall. Um, and then from there, you can have your scaled plan. Um, and so this is kind of like the next step from your bubble plan where you have all the plants that you want in your space and then it's everything is to scale. So your house, your existing structures, your pathways, and then the plants as well need to be to scale just so you have an idea of how much, how many plants you want to order. And um, it's also really important to have your plants to scale at maximum width um, so you don't have overcrowding and end up with too many plants or not enough plants. Um, and it does take a few years for plants to reach maturity, but it's just better to plan that they're already at maturity when it comes to drawing. Um, and here are some general landscape design tips for laying out plants. Um, for example, you want your plant groupings in odd numbers, um, and, you know, it, this is also a fun time to play around with different design elements, like, like Judy's background, for example, has this beautiful arbor in the background. So, you know, ha having fun with it and adding, you know, a water feature or a bird bath or boulders and a dry creek bed or um, just like fun, unique aspects to your garden. That's always exciting to add as well. So now that I've gone over just the how to with um, your site analysis and garden design tips, I'm going to go into removing your lawn. Um, and there are many ways to go about removing your lawn. There's solarization, there's rototilling, there is just applying herbicide or just removing it by hand. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to just go over sheet mulching, um, which is a great effective method for removing your lawn. So here are some pros and cons. Um, like I said, sheet mulching is a simple and effective way to remove your lawn um, it, while improving your soil. Um, and there's no, you know, you don't have to haul off the green waste or the sod. It all stays within the system, which is great. Um, that being said, it does require some advanced planning and it is time consuming in the sense where it's not a quick removal. Like it's gonna take at least a season or two for it to really work. So it does take some planning. And this does work best when your lawn is actively growing. So those are just some things to consider when going this route. Okay, so this is a great um, depiction of sheet mulching, just the beginning. Um, so the first step you're gonna do is um, mow your lawn completely and leave the grass clippings in place. Um, and like it's depicted in this image, you wanna cut out your pathways or areas also if you're gonna be planting large trees or shrubs. And then throughout this whole process, you're really gonna be watering this area effectively um, just to kickstart the decomposition process. You're basically kind of composting your entire lawn. So I'm not sure if, if people or if participants have experience um, with making their own compost, but 
it requires, um, this is kind of like a lasagna method where it requires um, layering and watering throughout the process. So once you have mowed your lawn, um, you add a layer of organic material. So that's usually compost. Um, and then you, on top of that, layer on newspaper or cardboard, um, ideally, um, I mean, either option works, but make sure if you're using cardboard that it's not like pizza boxes that's too greasy or waxy. Um, it's really important to just use like the most minimally processed um, cardboard or newspaper as possible. Um, you could also get B-roll as well. Um, and it's really important, like I keep saying, to layer and to have as much overlapping as possible because you're basically trying to like block out the sun, which will kill um, any weeds or lawn that you have. So, you know, having everything overlap is really important. Um, and then you just keep repeating. So you have the layering of the organic materials, then the newspaper, um, and then you keep repeating. And then if you have more green clippings, that totally works as well. Um, and you keep watering as well, just to keep everything in place. And like I said, to kickstart the decomposition process. And so it doesn't blow away also. Um, yeah, so this is a great depiction of kind of them doing it right in the middle. Um, and you can see that they have like some plants that they're leaving. Um, Oh, and I didn't mention earlier, but when you, I'll go back. So once you've done enough lasagna layering, um, you add on top one to two inches of organic compost, and then on top of that with four inches of mulch. Um, which is really important to retain the moisture and keep everything in. And I didn't mention this previously, but there's no like right or wrong way to do this. There's no like exact recipe. Um, like it's kind of just like lasagna. Everyone has their own way of doing it. But like I said, it's just really important to keep everything overlapping and keep everything moist as well. And once you're done, um, be sure to water the area about weekly if you're not doing this um, during the rainy season. So I guess I would recommend um, doing this project in the fall so you don't have to, or like late fall, so you don't have to water during the rainy, so you don't have to water it basically once you're done. Um, so once you've done that, um, I'm going to go into another fun aspect of this whole project, which is uh, plant selection um, of, yeah, so just choosing what plants you want to grow in replacing your lawn. So a key aspect of that is understanding what plant community you live in. Um, so it's really important to be observant and mindful of what plants grow in undeveloped parts of your area. I mean, it's great to walk around your neighborhood and see what all your other neighbors are growing, but another sort of source of inspiration is to really just explore and go hiking and observe the undeveloped um, com plant communities that is nearby. Um, and here's another great photo of that. And there are, you know, there are so many plant communities in California and in San Diego as well. Um, so really by determining your plant community, you can then narrow down and understand which plants work best for your own microclimate and soil conditions and um, other factors that impact plant selection. Um, another way to understand your plant community and choose plants is using calscape.org, which is a great resource. Um, and this is something that CNPS has is a, this is a website by CMPS. I'm not sure if, if any of you folks are familiar with it. I'm sure a lot of you are. Um, but this is a great database of over 3,000 plants that um, naturally be, that naturally grow in California. Um, so I'm going to just go over an example of how to use Calscape. Um, so I, yeah, it's just on here. So. 
what you can do is either go onto calscape.org and you can search for a specific plant or you can enter your local home address or your city or zip code and it will generate plants that naturally occur in that 10 mile radius that you inputted. So in this example, I inputted Long Beach um, and it generated 244 plants in, within the 10 mile vicinity. And you can see that it's char characterized by life form. So if you wanna be specific, um, you know, if you're only looking for, you know, screening shrubs or vines, um, you can just click on the specific category and it'll show all the plants. And it also gives detailed plant profiles, which um, not only help with growing conditions and understanding like when to just the planting and growing these plants, but it also is just great, gives a great um, perspective from a botanist perspective as well. Um, and wonderful photos from different um, life stages of the plant and its distribution. Um, so in order to save all the plants from Calscape, you need to create a Calscape account and then you can add specific plants to your plant list, um, which you can then print out and bring to your local native plant nursery. Um, so Calscape makes it really easy to not only choose plants, but create lists and um, just get a great idea of what um, you wanna grow in your space. And a new feature that we are going to be adding in the coming weeks, hopefully, is the Calscape Garden Planning Wizard, um, which is something that I personally spent a lot of time working on, the designs. Um, so basically, this program will have you answer a series of questions, and then it will generate um, a garden design based on your own preferences. And one of there's different categories, like if you want a more contemporary garden or an outdoor living garden or an HOA friendly space or a California natural garden. Um, there's even a design that's like a lawn to native conversion. So this will be an exciting feature to Calscape um, as well. And specifically to San Diego, there's this great rebate program um, with the San Diego Water Authority that really incentivizes, incentivizes um, you to replace your turf to natives. Um, so you get up to 350 per square foot, which offsets the cost of, you know, just the materials and everything that goes into converting your lawn to natives. And that is on um, waterwise.com. Um, and I'm happy to include the link to it in the chat as well. And that is it. So I'm happy to answer questions. I know I think I rushed through it pretty quickly. So I'm hoping we have time for questions. Um, and yeah, here's a beautiful picture of, I think a garden ambassador's native garden. And here's another photo. So these are just nice inspiration for all of you to get excited about um, native gardening. Yes, thank you. And we do have plenty of time for questions. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. so, um, and I know you said that you were going to include that Waterwise link in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, and for those of you who don't do, um, don't do Zoom very often, if you look at the bottom of your screen under chat, if you click on that, there's a, a chat box there. So you can um, put some questions out. You could take a look at some of the links that we provided. And yeah, um, yeah if you have any questions, you can put them there as well. So yeah, please um, put out some questions there in the chat. And um, Maya, if you can go ahead and add the link and then I'm gonna ask you a couple of the questions that have appeared. Great, yeah, that sounds yes. great. Okay, so um, can you talk a little bit about larval host plants that can be planted in a native garden? Yeah, so in that picture actually, um, the Asclepius um, or milkweed is a great host um, for, monarch caterpillars, um, or in just monarchs. Um, and 
also on Calscape, you can, I didn't mention it, but there's an advanced search option, which allows you to be really specific about what kind of plants you're looking for, which includes pollinator friendly plants. And it's great because it also shows um, which pollinators, like which butterflies and, and bees and whatnot um, attract are attracted to those specific plants. So that's a great feature. I'm happy to show um, like a, a screen share of the advanced search as well. Yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. And and I'm sorry, I was I was looking at the chat. Did you also talk about the butterfly and moth Calscape um, add-on that Dennis did? Oh, um, yeah, that? let's see. So through Waterways, let me get the, um, waterwise.com. Yeah, and also everyone- There's the um, website for- Okay, and um, yeah. everyone, yeah, just uh, keep in mind. So Maya, can you do a screen share of that as well? Of the- Of the- The yeah, pollinated the butterflies or... and- Yeah, Calscape butterflies and moths. Yeah. Okay, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, great. I'll get that okay. set up right now. I think it's yeah. sharing right now. So, and also, um, we are recording Maya's talk. So we'll have it available on the CNPSSD website. So for those of you who might be tuning in late or can think of another person or people that might be interested in also planting natives, um, it will be available for everyone to review at a future time. Yeah, great. Thanks for reiterating that. Um, so can you all see, I think you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. So here I'm on calscape.org and I just put in San Diego and I know that's a huge area, um, but you can see there's already 737 plants and that's really overwhelming. So what you can do is on the top right, it says advanced search. You can click on that. And then from here, you can really narrow down what you're looking for. So if you have a full sun, heart shade, you want maybe perennial herbs and shrubs and maybe some annuals as well. Um, and you want a plant that's, you know, pretty low water usage and fairly easy to grow. And then this is where you want, this is where you have the pollinator um, aspect that comes in. So you can have it as a bee, bird garden, butterfly host plant, hummingbird garden, plant. Um, <laughs> these are all the common uses that you can fill out um, and you can even do, you know, flower color and flowering season. I'm just going to leave that as is and you can search and then from here, okay, now you have a narrowed down list of plants that fulfill all these aspects that you're looking for. So let's look at this Epilobium canum. This is a very common California native um, throughout the state. And I think it's an incredibly beautiful plant. Um, and it gives you all this information as well as like the description and the form and how big it's gonna get. And then it shows these beautiful photos of all the different butterflies and moths that this plant hosts. Um, and it also includes nurseries that carry this plant. And, and this isn't always up to date, but it still gives you a great idea of all the different nurseries that carry um, this epilobium as well. So yeah, hopefully that answered that question. And you can also um, add it to your plant list. Like I was mentioning in the slideshow, um, you have to be, uh, you have to have a Calscape account in order to add it to your list, um, which I don't think I've lo I'm logged into mine, but you just click on add to your plant list and you can add it to your, you know, lawn to native plant list or front yard plant list or whatever you want to name it. Okay. Um, another question that we have, someone asked when the Calscape garden planner is going to be available. Yeah, that's, a, I have that question also. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be in the coming weeks, I hope. Um, it's a really, I'm, I'm really excited about this feature. Um, I'm, it's pretty much ready to go. I think we just have some last finishing touches and finalizing um, on, I think it's more like the front end development side. Um, so I think we'll definitely have like an announcement and maybe some sort of 
email blast when that comes out. Okay, great. And we are also going to be revamping Calscape to make it more user friendly and um, just have a better user experience with Calscape in the future. That's something that we're definitely working on as well. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And um, are you able to bring up the butterfly and moths Calscape to show everyone? Um, yeah, I think I just, I think you Did can see. Um, so like on this page with the epilobium canum or the- Okay, there we go. Yes, yeah, perfect. These are all the butterflies and moths that are hosted by the epilobium canum. Okay, terrific, thank so, you. And yeah. um, someone uh, mentioned follows the recommended time to plant California natives. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. or recommendations on planting in other seasons? And one of the things I wanna emphasize is even though autumn is the easiest because we are you know, obviously projecting and expecting that we're gonna get rain, you can plant year round. Um, you just have to treat it a little bit more different, a little differently. So you know, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, JD. Yeah, I think, you know, any time is a good time to plant natives if you're, you know, getting excited and um, have the ability to do so, but it does require a little bit more. Hello? Did she freeze? Maya, can you hear me? She's frozen over here. Can you hear me, Maya? Uh, she's frozen. I can hear you. Mm. Oh no. Okay, there you are. You you bleeped out for about 30 seconds. Oh no. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you were just talking about, I'm trying to think, go back 30 seconds. Bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I can Okay. I'm I yeah, I agree with what you said. I think any time is a good time to plant natives, but fall is definitely more favorable and ideal. But um just because of, you know, you, you can rely on, it's just easier because you can rely on rainfall um, and just the growing patterns of natives in general just make it easier in the fall. But by no yeah. means you can also, you know, plant really any time of year. Yeah, and one of the rules that I have learned is that um, when you're planting natives, let's say in the summer, um, <laughs> a good water regimen would be every day for a week, every week for a month, and then every month for a year. So kind of, you know, oh, gradually. Great. Yeah. Have you heard that? <laughs> yeah. I haven't. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. So anyway, again, every day for a week, every week for a month, and then every month for a year. So that's great. a good approach. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, somebody definitely. else. Yeah, somebody else has a question about assuming lawns have residual nutrient toxins in the soil. Are there natives that do well directly after sheet mulching? Or, or can basically any natives go in? What are your thoughts on that? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think you can have hardier shrubs maybe that go in initially after sheet mulching, like maybe five gallon heteromeles or... Um, uh, maybe use the, um, maybe instead oh, of the scientific uh, name. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, like Toyon or Ceanothus or coffee berry. I mean, these are very Northern California centric plants, but I think yeah, they also- right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another good thing in San Diego is of course we have the garden committee, which is a great place uh, where we get together and you can ask questions or you can ask um, friends or neighbors or get on our website to ask um, what plants work for people who are gardeners around us. And like Maya had suggested, take a hike in a canyon that's near you and see what kind of sages are out there. And again, if you have more space, you know, take a look at what kind of shrubs and sub shrubs um, are out there. And then you can make decisions based on that, of course, as well as using Calscape. Yeah, well put. Okay. Um, yeah, and keep, keep the questions coming. And I know Maya, you can also look at them as well. Um, but I, someone is asking, my objective is to have a wildlife garden as self-sustaining as possible. I recently became aware of how water is shared by companion trees and plants, the oak with deep root. Anyway, so um, yeah, if you wanna take a look at this, the question is, with this in mind, should I plant trees and get them established before proceeding to the companion plants? That's a great question. Um... I, I guess so. I mean, 
I, I don't I think feel, you can go either way. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like that too, because sometimes when you get the smaller yeah. plants established, you know, you can kind of add on the bigger plants. I feel like there's not necessarily one prescribed way. Um, yeah. And I, I do want to put it out there. I, I have a wonderful, I think, um, front yard native garden and a lovely backyard. And if anyone ever wants to contact me, I'm always happy to give socially distanced <laughs> um, tours of my garden as well. And I don't know if there are other people around who would also be interested in saying, yeah, if you want to come and take a look and get some inspiration, um, you know, that's part of what the garden yeah. committee does is show off what we have and give advice to other people. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I also think that gardening is such an explorative, experimental journey. So it's like, there's no right or wrong way. There's no exact right time you have to plant your natives and the timing doesn't have to be the same, you know? So it's like, it's all an experiment and I don't think there's a right or wrong way um, to go about gardening, especially gardening with natives. Um, yeah. And it evolves over time, you know? You can see that some, it's nice to add plants as you go. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, and like I was saying, you can start small and just, you know, have a few native perennials in your space and see how they react. And um, it's just good to start than just to not. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> it's the, better, the best time is to get started yesterday or yeah. tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and um, Carolyn makes a good point about having um, an elevated bird bath or water station. And you know, certain fountains really bring in um, bird species, which is wonderful. So yeah, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. Somebody also asks, um, what's your opinion on jute mesh for soil erosion on a steep hillside? Um, I mean, I think you can use a combination of the jute mesh and having native plants above it, I, generally. Um, because a lot of, also that is, a that is a feature you can add to Calscape in the advanced search are plants that can help stabilize soils um, like on hillsides. So. I think a lot of, there are a lot of native plants out there that have deep root systems that allow hillsides to stay intact. Um, okay. And advice for keeping rabbits and gophers away from young natives while establishing a garden. Oh, I have a, a big problem with that here. Um, just, just pests and rodents in general. Um, I mean, from my personal experience, it's kind of sad, but I really just cage up my plants as much as I can when they're just getting established. Um, but so I when know you talk about cages, do you mean, um, do you put like chicken wire cages underneath? I know one thing that we do is um, I'll take a plant, the pot itself, and I will snip around the sides so that the roots can come out, but the actual original root ball is protected. Mm. Um, so that's one thing I do. So yeah, maybe you can share what you do. Yeah, I've done that before. That definitely works. Um, in my, but I also just do chicken wire and just try to get a few inches deep in the soil um, and just cover the bed um, with chicken wire, which works as well. Um, yeah, and one thing I see a lot for revegetation is they have those cones for rabbits that work really well. There are these large cones that they put over the plants. They're about this tall, maybe about two or three feet tall. And you just slip it over the plant with a couple of bamboo stakes. And that does not allow the rabbits to nibble at the plants. So until the plant gets to be one or two feet tall and is better established, I've seen that um, very, be very effective for rabbits. Mm, cool. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of ways to go about it. Like I was saying, gardening is just, it just evolves over time and it's all about experimentation and also just, you know, having expectations that not all your plants are going to be successful and there's going to be things that come along and that's just a part of the um, experience. Yeah, it can be frustrating though. <laughs> been a bit yeah, of a challenge. Definitely. I know. It's yeah. Been a challenge. Um, other questions? Someone's saying you did an excellent job of presenting, Maya. Thank <laughs> you. Um, let me skim some more. Um, yeah, again, if anyone else. Okay, how important is the type of irrigation system you install? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, there are a lot of different methods. Um, it is very important. I mean, I, 
I guess there's a lot of different opinions with the irrigation and natives, but um, you know, drip irrigation is a great option. Um, it kind of concentrates. Yeah, I know it's not really. <laughs> yeah, we're told. Not, sorry, you were actually. Yeah, that, no, 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 yeah we're told no drip. <laughs> yeah, drip is drip is really not ideal for natives because it's not what they're they've been evolved to. You know, they don't really get their water just at the base. Um, so that's that's not really the ideal type of irrigation. Um, overhead or hand watering is what I do. Um, Judy, what do you what do you recommend? Yeah, so um, I actually don't have any irrigation um, in yeah. my native plant garden. Um, I do every three weeks or so in the summer. I stand outside in the cool of the evening, and I hand water or I put a sprinkler and I do like a 45 minute to an hour watering, you know, a couple of days in a row. Um, and then I back off for three or four weeks. Um, but I, I would say ideally, if you're looking for something low maintenance um, that, you know, Hunter apparently is the best quality irrigation, um, definitely overhead sprinkling, and then just whatever kind of regimen. Again, you shouldn't need to water in the winter or the spring, but in the summer, about every three weeks and they say a deeper watering less frequently rather than um, more frequent lighter waterings. Um, and I've also heard from um, Mike Evans at Tree of Life Nursery and uh, Musa Creek that um, plants do in the summer enjoy just a light watering, you know, just for like five minutes, just kind of um, rinsing off their leaves uh, really helps them. So again, it's the old 12 rabbis, 13 opinions. <laughs> so I'm just sharing with everyone, you know, what I've heard and what seems to work yeah. best for me. And if there's yeah. anyone else, yeah, who wants to jump in, if you want to send a chat and say, hey, unmute me, I'd like to share something. Yeah, that sounds great. And I okay. think also, oh okay. yeah, someone. Weed management while plants are getting established. Um, is it advisable to spread mulch around the plant but not touching the plant, absolutely. Would you talk about mulch and kind of, you know, keeping the mulch away from the, the base of the plant or the, yeah. the trunk? Yeah, I think that's definitely really critical. Um, yeah, can you um, uh, elaborate on that? Oh, um, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's important to, you know, have the plant, like allow room for the plant to grow um, without having mulch actually touch the base. Um, just the base of the to, stem. Yeah, right? the base of the stem. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a really critical part when you are applying mulch. Um, and can you just, can you explain why? Oh, just in order to, to I don't, I mean, I don't really know exactly why. Yeah. Just, so, so you, uh, yeah, if you have the water around the, the trunk, let's say uh, the base of a, a shrub or a tree, and you have mulch there, it encourages, there's too much moisture there and it encourages rotting. So after you put the plant down, you would want the mulch maybe six inches from the base of the stem of the plant so that the stem isn't experiencing any kind of rotting. Yeah, that's because mulch does a great job at retaining moisture. So you don't want too much moisture within that range. Yeah, um, so you want it in the root zone, but not directly on the stem. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it looks like Greg Rubin recommends MP3 rotators for irrigation. And according to Christine, she has them and her natives are thriving. So that's great. That's a solid recommendation. Um, looks like someone else recommended them as well. Um, yeah. And I, I, someone and says, other, Courtney I says, I've always enjoyed hand watering. It's therapeutic to me. I totally agree. There's something about, you know, yeah. after the sun is going down and just standing out there and kind of like being with your plants um, on a, a nice summer evening. Yeah. Absolutely. It's great. Yeah. I definitely, hand watering is the way that I go as well. I think a lot of it is also the timing. It's nice being able to wake up in the early morning and water plants before the sun comes up or in the evening as well. Um, just to have that time to water is really critical. Mm -hmm. Right. Other questions, feel free to jump in at the end. We are looking um, for any other questions. And then um, plants, uh, native plants tend to retain more moisture. So if, as far as like fire prevention, mm -hmm. um, do you wanna talk about that? 
Yeah, um, I know someone mentioned Greg Rubin, and he's very much all about natives with uh, uh, like firewise landscaping. But yeah, basically, um, because natives have the ability to retain more water compared to drought tolerant non native counterparts, um, they require less water to be hydrated, um, which then means that if a fire were to come through and your plants are hydrated, that kind of creates an extra barrier for um, them to not be ignited and to save your house, hypothetically. Um, so I think that's one aspect to, you know, firewise landscaping is having your plants being well watered. And because natives require less water, um, it's just easier to keep them hydrated um, and prevent them from, uh, you know, catching on fire. Right. Okay. Go down. Um, Ant problem. Okay, I have a lot of natives and was having an ant problem. I bought ant freight in little plastic containers, placed them around the base. Um, okay, so yes, there's been a, a, a lot of talk about ants and how ants can um, really attack plants like Ceanothus. Um, so do you wanna chat a little bit about that? Yeah, I don't have any experience of ants personally, but I'm thinking that there are probably um, natural remedies to kind of detract ants from coming, um, like ant bait. Huh. Um, yeah, okay. And we can, you know, Greg really talks about that a lot. So I just didn't know if you had any particular recommendations no. um, about that. Okay. And someone says watering at night, um, not considered the best time. Yeah. Um, I've heard, yeah. Uh, you know, again, then you have the moisture sitting there. So early morning is the best, yeah. but if the difference is between like the only time you're available and you don't have irrigation, is it, I, I've heard it's better to do that than not at all, but I agree. Early morning is the best time um, for watering yeah. plants. Yes. Oh, definitely. and here's a good question. Um, what types of fountains best attract birds? Whoa. Um... That's a great question. I mean, I think just the typical bird bath style where you have like that bowl, I'm guessing that's a that's what I've seen really effectively attract birds. Um, they and can kind the of bubblers, play. yeah, yeah ones that kind bubblers. of shoot up, yeah, where the hummingbirds yeah. kind of come in, um, yeah. or waterfalls, yeah, so moving water is great. But, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to have a plug-in fountain, then any, any water for um, wildlife is, is better than none. You just have to make sure that you're emptying it so you're not having um, mosquito larva, of course. But yeah, moving yeah. water um, can help that as well. Yeah, yeah and it okay, looks like some... said she has a simple water tray with a solar bubbler in it and it works the best for her. So yeah, you don't have to have something super elaborate. Um, yeah, solar, sounds... yeah, those of you who don't know, you can buy something where it literally is just run off of solar. So you put it in a place where there's enough sun and the sun uh, keeps it going. Um, so again, that's a good way to discourage um, the mosquito larva problem and, and to attract wildlife. And somebody has a specific recommendation here um, about a small copper bird bath. Okay. Okay, some more recommendations. Okay, any other questions? Put them out there. Um, and yeah, thank you. This has been very helpful. And again, thank you for sharing the PowerPoint. Um, it will be available for everyone to uh, preview or review again and to share with other people as well. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah, else? Of course. Chris thank yeah, Christine, did you want to add anything? No, I think you guys have covered a lot of ground, uh, lots of good information. And certainly if anyone wants to get in touch with the garden committee and um, if you have any questions, you can go to gardening at uh, cnpssd.org and send us your questions uh, there. Yeah, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, yeah, and you can also get on the, our website and um, contact us that way. You can find our email there. I put my email in the chat as well. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So there's plenty of resources out there if you have more specific questions. 
Yeah, and um, I, I do also want to um, let people know, local to San Diego, that Musa Creek, you can order online and they deliver to 10 different nurseries around the county. So whether you're in East County or South County or North County or Central County, um, you can order online from Musa Creek. And then I think their deliveries go out on Monday and they bring them to the nursery and you just pick them up at the nursery. If you're a CNPS member, show your card, you get a 10% discount. Um, of course, there's Tree of Life Nursery um, in Orange County. I forget what area it is. Mike Evans is awesome. It's a wonderful place for a day trip. Um, yes, and there's- And they also, nurseries. Tree of Life also gives CNPS members a 10% get discount. And then Mission Hills Nursery, uh, um, carries Musa Creek natives and they also give a 10% discount. Yeah. Oh, thank you. San Juan Capistrano. Thank you, Karen. Um, yes. Okay. And uh, Christine says, once it's posted to CMPS SD, um, we will send the link. So everyone will have access. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone for attending. Great to see people's names and um, stay tuned for our March, March um, David um, Newsom talk. Great, thank you so much for having me. Thank okay. you. Thank you. you, Maya. It was great. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. Good night. Thank you, good night. Thank good you. Night. Good night.